Good evening. Um, I'm going to apologise for the, um, the problems we had with the technology. Um, so we will go quickly um, to Vic and John and start the evening off from now. If you have any questions, put them through and we will ask as many as we can at the end. Okay, I'm going to leave you now, so I will speak to you soon. Chris, thank you very much indeed. And Chris, thank you very much indeed for sorting out the technical problems. We're very grateful uh, for that. Um, welcome from me in a, a pretty dismal Devon, to be honest. It's raining, it's miserable, but we're going to brighten up your evening by talking to a bona fide Swindon Town legend. Now, they don't come much bigger than this. Norman John Trollope, MBE. A very good evening to you, John. Um, now then, I, I'm going to ask you this question first and foremost, because I've forgotten this. Um, but the great Clive King always used to call you Jim, and your teammates always used to call you Jim. Why did they call you Jim? Uh, it was in the early 60s, uh, in an away programme. It had uh, Jack Woolen, which is Terry Woolen, and uh, Jim Trollope. <laughs> uh, and mine stuck. Terry's didn't jack up, but Jim did. And I, when they call me Jim, people, you know, tend to say, who are you talking to? You know, but the, the 69 side especially, and before that, um, called me Jim. Well, it always, confu yeah, it always confused me when Clive King called you that, but I, yeah. you know, I thought he's Clive King. I'm not going to argue with it, but that's the reason. Very good. Yeah. 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 And you mentioned Terry Woolen, and I think it's fair to say that we ought to mention this because you and he you were the youngest pair of fullbacks to appear in the Football League. You were 17, I think, and Terry was 16? No, um, I think we were both 17. Um, right. I think I, I was 17 in the June, and I'm sure Terry's birthday is July, I'm not sure. Uh, so we were just 17 playing in, in August. Um, but... Ernie Hunt and Mike Summerby obviously had started the season before at 17 as well. So there was a lot of us. And uh, of that side, it's Swindon Boys, Ernie Hunt, Terry Woolen, Roger Smart, myself. We all made it and had quite a number of appearances. So that's how it all started, really. Yeah, Terry Woolen, many might remember, of course, Woolen's off licence uh, in Gores Hill. Always on the corner there, wasn't it? And there was a family... Um, a connection with A.D. Vivash, who, of course, later played for the town as yeah. well, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Terry married uh, A.D.'s aunt, auntie is it? Or, or cousin or something like that. She was a Vivash anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. But, I worked with Chris Vivash, who was the you? uncle of A.D. Vivash. Yeah, so it's all... Yes, very nice. Now, let's start at the very beginning then. Um, you come from Rawton, clearly, obviously a local boy. How did your connection with the town start? Um, it was about Swindon boys, um, again, the, the people I mentioned, Terry Woolen, Ernie Hunt, uh, Roger Smart, myself, and a couple of others. Uh, we were in the Swindon boys side and uh, we were just picked up by, by uh, I think it was Ellis Stuttard, who was assistant manager to Burt Head in those days. And I didn't come out, actually, because I stayed on at school. Till I was 16, we could leave at 15, but Ernie, Terry and Mike and that had been here and I didn't come till the October of 1959 after leaving school because I went into a, an account office and things like that because uh, I was quite good at maths in those days. <laughs> uh, so I wasn't picked up, they didn't think, you know, but by October I'd played in the under 16 side and in the end they, they gave me the, on the ground staff in those days. And yeah, that's how, and, that's how yeah, it so, and Bert Head, of course, uh, wasn't frightened to put any younger players in, as you mentioned. And, and I also sort of looked around today and I find that you are one of the few footballers I know that's on a movie database because of that very famous documentary, Six Days to Saturday. Do you remember that being filmed? I do, yeah. I got the, I got the video. Um, yeah, we, we uh, played at Preston. And we uh, we flew from South Marston at Air Aerodrome, actually. I think it was an old Dakota or something like that. It wasn't too good a plane, I don't think. But, you know, to, to fly in those days was unbelievable. Um, but we had the cameras following us, you know, so. Um, yeah, yeah, that must have been some experience because, as you said, you know, 
most of the time you were traveling on a rickety old bus to places up north but here you are where did you fly to liverpool is that where you went into i think we might i don't know preston don't have a an airport do they or anything i don't know i don't know i can't remember where we we went to but certainly uh we flew which was not heard of in those days yeah quite an experience for a young footballer for a group of young footballers oh, i would yeah. imagine yeah uh, in the early 60s uh, i mean we there was obviously about uh, six or seven 21 and under in the early 60s so i mean as you say it happened where really when um we had a public practice game as they used to in, and it was the reds versus the blues and uh we were all in the blues and we beat the reds seven two um and by the start of the season uh bert had put us in you know so for, from the October 1959, uh, I was only there from there. And then I made my debut the following August. So I, I don't think I played a dozen reserve games in that time. So, you know, it was quite a, quite a quick rise, really. But it was down to Bert because he, he, he had the nerve to put us all in. Yeah, very good indeed. And that aside, of course, got promotion. Uh, the first promotion up, until the, up to the second division. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. We, 62-63, uh, it was the uh, the bad winter. Uh, and we, we kept playing because we had, they called them batter boots in those days, and uh, we could stand up. But the other, you know, I, I think now they wouldn't even consider playing, let alone, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, it, it, luck was on our side. We we uh, kept playing, and we, we were in the top, at the top of the league. And uh, the others had to sort of uh, have a, quite a few games to catch us up and we did stay up at the top. So, yeah, for the first time in the history, we went into what is now the championship. Yeah, indeed. And um, a great start as well the following season. You, you you did OK, didn't you? Oh, yeah, for about eight games, we, I think we we did tremendously well, you know, and uh, I think uh, we beat some uh, good sides in those days, as they were, you know, so... Uh, and we played some good football. We had some good players, Bobby Woodruff, obviously Ernie Hunt, Mike Summerby, Keith Morgan, Terry, Roger Smart. And then we had Morris Owen and uh, people like that in the centre of defence with Arnold Darcy on the left and Don coming on, on, on the scene. Yeah, you mentioned the pitches, which we'll get on to a little later. And I often wonder, you know, how some of these players would deal with today's pitches, which are carpets considering, you know, what you used to play on, aren't they, really? I mean, by, by sort of November, December, you had four sort of green triangles in the corners. The, the middle of the pitch was just uh, mud uh, and or dust if it was nice and dry, but that wasn't very often in the winter, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, you just got on with it. And, I mean, if... They moan about, oh, that's the pitch don't look very good. And I think it was one game in the way. Is it Liverpool? They had sort of different coloured patches. And they're, they're you know, it's, <laughs> it's so different now. I mean, it must be tremendous to play on that. And I've always said, I, um, what Don, how we used to dribble um, on the pitches we played on, what he'd do now, I don't know. He, he would be unplayable, I think, would he not? Well, it, it was that change of pace, a different shoulder, and away he went, you know. Uh, and uh, obviously, he could finish as well. But on a on a surface where the ball's nice and true, not bouncing on your shins. And I mean, a great example is the the goal at Wembley, isn't it? When he went in from his own half on a muddy pitch, but he kept control of the ball brilliantly. Yeah, absolutely. I can remember. I can visualise it now uh, from where I was stood at that Wembley Stadium. We'll talk about Wembley a little okay. bit later, of course. Uh, relegation followed and, and actually the departure of some pretty big names when you think about it. Ernie Hunt, Mike Summerby, uh, people like that. Bobby Woodruff, you mentioned, but had, I think, took him to Crystal Palace. Um, no, I, so relegation followed and, and that was a blow to the club? Yeah, I think so. I, I, it was the... I think Bobby Woodruff had gone the year before and then when we did get relegated, I think Mike and Ernie... Obviously, went Man City and Wolves, and uh, that was the breakup of it, really. But uh, then Danny Williams came in, obviously, and we know what happened there. 
We certainly do. Um, <laughs> I, I've had great fun this afternoon um, looking through that. Uh, you can remember what that is. Uh, also, the personal scrapbook of Danny Williams, which uh, is available in the club shop, I do believe. Uh, yeah. What are your memories when Danny Williams first came through the door? Because I think he'd been out of football for a little while, hadn't he? I think so. It, uh, he was at Rotherham one year as manager because he, he played all his career at one club, actually. And uh, I think he took over very similar to, to how I went on it, really. But uh, yeah, he was totally different to Bert Head. Bert was, uh, you know, quite abrupt and told, told you what <laughs> what it was all about and in no certain terms. Uh, but Danny was more, just let you play. And that is where... Um, Thankfully for him, he, he let me overlap and things like that. Because with Bert, I, I didn't start until Danny came here and he just said, join in. Uh, and obviously one of his remits was get the ball, give it to Don and follow him sort of thing and <laughs> <laughs> go around the outside if you can. <laughs> <laughs> I always I, I always refer, when I'm talking about you to people, I always refer to you as the first modern wing back. Because that was your position, really, wasn't it? You got up and down, didn't you? You were incredibly yeah, fit. We nearly, we nearly played as a back three because uh, Frank, Stan and Rob Thomas, uh, I mean, they, they more or less stayed at home, as, as you such, and allowed me to go forward. Um, and, yeah, I, I mean, that, that, that was just Danny. He, he just said, you got the energy to do it, go and do it. So, and I think Terry Cooper at Leeds was uh, another one early on, you know, but... Certainly, we were one of the first ones to start overlapping, and uh, you know we were told to get back though. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I mean I would, you know, you. I have to say, you inspired me to run a Swindon marathon because I, you did the first one, if I remember rightly, did you not? Yeah. Yeah, and I often saw you training around Highworth, and I thought, well, John Trollope's done it. That's good enough for me because you like to run, didn't you? I like to run. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, after I finished, I. I continued road running and uh, into my fifties, and unfortunately, it went, uh, and that was the end of that. Really, because uh, I had it done, replacement, uh, and I said, "Oh, that that means I can jog again now." He said, "Well, don't come back to me if if, <laughs> if it goes again. Don't come back to me because no, you shouldn't be doing that." But we didn't have the footwear, and obviously, it didn't help. No, you mentioned the baseball boots. Uh, I mean, they had no soul at all, if I remember rightly. Um, and, and, no. and what were you training in? I mean, we all know about trainers these days. They're scientifically put together, things like that. But what were you training in? No, they, they, they were decent uh, trainers we, we had, but not, not like they are today where, you know, you, you, well, all sorts, aren't they? They're personally measured and everything. Same as boots, isn't it? You know, I mean, they're totally different now to to what we wore. But uh, no, I mean that that was the thing at the time, and, and uh, you just got on with it. Yeah, get on with it. You did. Um, let's move forward to that season then. Um, you played three hundred and sixty-eight games in a row, which is bonkers, really, when you look at today's football, isn't it? Uh, incredible co consistency. But unfortunately for you, 68-69 didn't have a great start, did it? No. Uh, it was probably one of my worst uh, seasons. Um, I played at uh, Torquay in the first round of the League Cup, and the next week we were at uh, Hartlepool. Um, and I went up for a header, big centre forward. I can't remember his name now, big centre forward. Come bundling into me. I thought, push me, well, didn't push me, barred me over. Caught my arm wrong, and uh, uh, it was only when I went to take a throw in, I thought, oh, you know, and uh, there was a bone sticking out, and uh, Harry Cousins come on and said, you better come off. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's how it was. And uh, so having played all seven years without missing a game, and then obviously after that, the, the lads had done brilliant. I mean, Owen Dawson came in, Rod Thomas switched to left back, and... Uh, uh, until January, and then I came back and I played in midfield because they were playing so well. So, and then, fortunately for me, unfortunately for Owen, he he, he got an injury in a, in February March time, which allowed me in. Now the only one who ever knew whether he had played Owen, if he'd have been fit or me, Danny. But 
We'll never know. We'll never know. Um, and we'll get on to that game very shortly. But I just wonder, you know, as a footballer, of course, to be that consistent and play that many games, did you ever think there was a possibility you'd be injured? I guess you must have done at some point because fo- injury is part and parcel of football, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, uh, with a contact sport, you're going you're gonna to have knocks in that. Uh, I, I was really quite a quick healer, but I did... I did do a lot at home myself without the uh, treatment of uh, Harry and Kevin and people like that who, who used to do it. And, uh, you know, but I seem to get over injuries very quickly. And I mean, I, I played in that seven years with a, with quite a, a big strapping on the ankle and all this kind of thing, which I don't, I think all the, the physiotherapists and uh, medical people nowadays would advise them not to play. Whereas, they said, ah, we'll strap you up, you'll be all right. <laughs> that's how it, that's how it, that's the difference now. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, so then, uh, so that uh, sort of period, March, I mean, there you are, you're, you're nip and top with Watford at the top of the league, yeah. whose manager was the great Ken Furphy. I worked with him many times down here in Devon, wonderful yeah. gentleman. He often takes the mickey out of me for that defeat by Watford on Grand National Night, which was a 1-0 win, which gave them the title effectively, didn't it? Yeah, we, it was, you know, we, we were there or thereabouts most of the season. Um, although, as I say, I spent most of it watching rather than playing, but uh, it was certainly uh, not good. I'm not a good, good spectator, I'm afraid. And, uh, you know, especially when you could play. And I, 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 throughout my career, I went many times where I was in the stand, if you get what I mean. So. Mm. The consistency of that team was amazing, though, wasn't it? So uh, take us through March uh, 1969, and particularly uh, to uh, the week leading up to that momentous game. Now, if I remember rightly, England played France and won 5-0 on a pitch which has been churned up by the Horse of the Year show and incessant rain. And I have to tell you, when I turned up at Wembley, I've never been so disappointed in my life. It was like (laughs) turning up to this mecca of football and seeing a pitch which was basically like Western Superman Beach. Uh, how did you feel when you got there? Yeah, I think I think we felt the same because the old saying was, oh, the pitch is like Wembley. <laughs> and it wasn't like Wembley. I mean, it was... But looking back, I think it, it did help us because we were a pretty fit side. Danny had us fit. Um, you know, we could run. And uh, we, we did last the game very, very well. And I think when it went to extra time, I fancied us because, you know, <clears throat> Arsenal didn't have that, uh, the, you know, willingness in that, that mud. I don't think they, they sort of thought, well, you know, it's not, not a pitch you should be playing on. But they wouldn't play now, would they? So it's totally different. But I think it helped us on the day. And they had this legendary flu bug, which had gone around Highbury the week before, apparently. Is that right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Probably somebody, you know, a couple of them have had the sniffles, I suppose, and they've they blown it up in, but nobody will know, I don't know. <laughs> no. And actually, let's put this in perspective, because these days the, the League Cup isn't taken as seriously as many people might want. But in those days, this oh, was yeah. a d- big deal, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I find that strange, because it's a national competition, and even the FA Cup, I, I don't like it when... You know, they said it's a squad, but I, I think you should go out to win any trophy you can win. And uh, to change 10 or 11 players, uh, I, I'm not sure that's the right thing. I think it's a little bit of a lack of respect for the competition. Well, anyway, you won it at a time when it really meant something. Roger Smart gets the goal, the opening goal, in one of the biggest dog's breakfasts of defensive mix-up in the history of football. There's no question about that. Yeah, yeah. What were your thoughts when Roger... I mean, we'd seen a magnificent goalkeeping display from Peter Browns, but I just remember him flinging himself all over the penalty area, making save after save. I think, I, I think the first 20 minutes, if it hadn't have been for Peter, we, we wouldn't have been in the game. Um, certainly, uh, I didn't see John Radford for about 25 minutes. Uh, you know, just played for England and the big strong lad and the pitch didn't matter to him because he he was a strong and fat and I can't, I can't say I see him much in the first 20 minutes or so but Peter and Stan and uh, um, Frank 
they were superb up and kept us in the game. And obviously, then we managed to get in front. Yeah, what about that goal? What were your feelings when it went all in? Were you thinking, great, we've got a goal, or it's only 35 minutes gone, we've got a long way to go? Oh, no, no. You, I, I never thought when you score in the first half, you, you won the game, and, you know, anything can happen, can it? Uh, I think it's been proved many times since that, uh, you know, you can never, never say you've won a game, I don't think, unless you're about five up with added time to go. <laughs> the, it, the sickener of course was Bobby Gould who uh, many Swindon fans will remember for that smile after it equalised uh, Brian Moore said uh, it was a great smile Swindon fans less so yeah, um, and he'd actually been involved in an incident which he, I mean today could have been off the pitch couldn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. but we got away with quite a lot now I mean some of the bookings and red cards now I mean they're winning the ball and they're getting booked, you know. And But in those days, you could bump. And I mean, Harry Cousins always said to me, he said, if you got a winger, he said, first five minutes, give him a bump. He said, and then he knows you're about. Uh, and that's that, that is how we looked at it. And, and I think the good thing about it is that, that players never overreacted to being bumped. You know, they picked themselves up and next time they done you. Mm -hmm. uh, so... It, Again, everything's changed in, in football. It's, it, it's quite a different game than what we played. It was a sickener, though, wasn't it? Just moments to go, really. And uh, Bobby Gould, it's a bit like the World Cup final, isn't it? When Weber got the goal to yeah. take it into extra time, it was a similar sort of feeling, I'm guessing. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, I would think it was a long ball forward. It, it flicked and then it fouled, didn't it? Straight to him. So, you know, that happens. That, you know, but uh, as I said, I think we weren't... So we were were worried because usually the team who gets a late goal has the impetus to go and, and win it. But we extra time to us uh, with the fitness we had, I don't think caused you know no problem at all. So into extra time then, and uh, Don gets the one just before half time, and and it wasn't a classic Don Rogers goal, although the control in the penalty area was magnificent, wasn't it? No, he uh, it. He changed, I think he changed feet, didn't he, or something to put it in. And he, he was, I mean, he, he could score goals, different types of goals, Don. Um, and, uh, you know, to get back up again, 2-1 up. So that we were on our way. Yeah, fantastic. And, and then that goal, which clinches it. I mean, my word, it is one of Wembley's greatest goals, isn't it? Well, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, he's picked the ball up in his own half and just gone and gone and gone and gone and sort of went round Bob Wilson in the end and slid it in. I mean, and there was no comeback from that because it was about the last minute or so, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, magnificent. And I can tell you, I can still see it now, uh, you know, as he rounds him and just slots it into the yeah. corner of the net. Magnificent. But it was uh, the control he had when he was going because, as you say, it wasn't the best of pitches. Uh, but he just seemed to... Be able to control it even on those type of pitches. So, you know, he's the best best player I've ever played with on the ball. I mean, he, and not only could he create goals, he was a good goal scorer. What about the feeling then when that one went in? Was that relief? Oh, that was it. Yeah, yeah. You knew, you know, everybody knew that was it. You know, so to do that, being in the the old third division, League One, as it is now, you know. So, uh, you know, it's uh, one one thing they can never take away from me. No, absolutely not. And why would they? Um, celebrations afterwards, of course, um, and a fantastic reception in the town the following day. But you still had the business of promotion to complete, didn't you? So, what was Danny Williams's message to you? I think I think he just said, "Well, we, to to do what we did was was." was tremendous but don't forget our our aim for the season was to get promoted so i think i think we did we lose at plymouth at, straight after yes yeah plymouth afterward i think it was about four wasn't it was it three or four or i can't remember the exact score um oh, and yeah, yeah yes uh, which for me living in devon is always a painful memory i have to tell you <laughs> uh but uh you know it, it is a fantastic um performance but yeah. and eventually you did 
go we up, did. albeit um, on goal difference from the aforementioned Watford team. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't a title. Did that matter or not? Uh, in some ways, yes, because, uh, you know, you always want to win the league, don't you? But um, I think after winning the League Cup, I think just to get promoted, we accepted that, you know, and uh, it, it was a, obviously a, a, a part of the club's history to be the first time, you know, or the second time to, to go up to the championship. Yes, indeed. Um, now then, in the summer, um, Arthur Hull Horsfield comes in. And uh, that is quite a signing, isn't it? Because, you know, he's a goal scorer, comes in from Middlesbrough, added to a team that's already uh, doing very well. And what a fantastic first season that was. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a good team. I mean, uh, people have asked me, they said, well, what team did you think was the best at 62, 63 or the 68, 69? And I said, well, they were both different. But obviously... Um, the achievement of the 68-69 team was tremendous and we did continue very similar to the 62-63 when we started very well. Um, obviously, we didn't quite maintain it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I like the 62-63 because we were a lot of low lads who come through together. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't like to split the two because it's unfair on, on saying one's better than the other. What about Stan Harland as a captain? He always strikes me as the kind of ultimate captain in a way. I mean, maybe it's my memory and roast-tinted specs, but I would imagine he was a leader, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. Him and Frank. I mean, Frank was nearly joint captain, I think, because he used to give me more stick than Stan. When you're going to defend, his, his comments was to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, when, you, when you're going to defend... Um, but those two were, they led us. Uh, and in the 68, 69 side, I thought also that one of the main men was John Smith in midfield. Those yeah. three actually run the side, I thought. We had good players, Joe and Roger in midfield with John, uh, Don Heath on the right, Peter Noble, people like that, Rod and myself. But I, I thought uh, those three were, were our leaders, if you get what I mean. John Smith in England, B International, I think I'm right in saying. Is that right? He was superb. Yeah, uh, yeah. And if there was any trouble, he just used to say, leave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> now, in terms of, of, of that season to come, um, you know, you're going up into Division 2. Um, I mean, I don't know. Equate it to the, how the Championship is now. There's big money in the Championship these days, isn't it? Would you... Was the leap as big going up to the Division 2 as it would be now? How would you, how would you sum that up? I think, it, you know, it's difficult to compare, you know, then and now because we didn't have the foreign players. So, really, the, a lot of the British lads have come down to the championship because, you know, they, they can't get a game in the Premier League, you know, whereas in our day, the majority of uh, the Division One players, as it was then, were, were British players, weren't they? You know, so... It, it's very hard to compare because it is the makeup of the sides are totally different to it to what we had. Yeah, but my goodness me, you came perilously close to getting in the first division, didn't you? That was oh, yeah. a terrific season. Fifth, oh, yeah. I think. Is that right? Yeah. Um, with, with, did you finish fifth? I think that that think season. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. a bit more, we 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 probably got there, but it was a tremendous, and that's probably, you know. Till obviously the 90s, it was the nearest we sort of got to get into uh, the top league. I just remember one night against Blackpool, um, the great Jimmy Arnfield was playing for Blackpool on that night. 28,000, if I remember rightly. Arthur Horsfield gets you an early goal, finishes a draw, and then it just kind of dissipated. That season just drifted away, didn't it, after that? Oh, yeah, we'd we done well. And, uh, you know, you talked about Arthur coming in. I he, he was a good goal scorer. I know some of the crowd didn't like him, but we liked him because he, he was a good goal scorer. You you put the ball in the box and Arthur would be there or thereabouts, you know, which is is, is what you want from a striker. You know, and uh, the, the players liked him if some of the crowd didn't. <laughs> Amazing, really, isn't it? How our fans sort of, I don't know, pick on a player and just don't take to them. It's weird, isn't it? Well, uh, 
But you have it. I mean, on Str uh, Shrivenham Road side, so you'll stand there and in the left back position. Obviously, I was out there and uh, I had this bloke, and don't matter what I'd done, hang him up, Trollop, and I'm only about 23. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, amazing. Goodness me. Nearly every game. <laughs> yeah. I've just been told we lost 2-1 at Plymouth today at the match after Wembley. Because you, you'd done a lap of honour with the trophy, if I'm right. Is that right? Lost. Yeah, I know we lost after. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, missed out on promotion. But, of course, we should then say, uh, because you were a third division side at the time, this ridiculous ruling that you couldn't play in European competition because you weren't, first or yeah. second or whatever so the Italian adventure what an extraordinary few games that was well I mean the Anglo-Italian Cup and that was that was a real good one for us because I mean Fred Ford had took over manager by then because Danny had gone to Sheffield Wednesday um, and it was a great experience you know I mean Italian teams come over I think we had three or four games here and three or four games over there, I think, and then obviously the final. And if you were top of the, the two leagues, I think, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. I mean, let's not mess about here. You are playing teams that nowadays are looked upon as European giants and were indeed in those days as well. Juventus, Napoli, yeah. people yeah. like that. These yeah. are pretty decent teams, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. No, it was a great experience. And, uh, you know, they took it quite seriously. I mean, some of the, you know, the player, top players there played in it. And uh, but we, we were a good team. And, I mean, uh, in the Anglo-Italian final, I mean, we were 3 nil up, although the match was abandoned. But, uh, and there's a little story there, because it was abandoned, because there were slabs on the terrace in, and they broke them up and started throwing them. And we were, I was that side, and Don was that side, and... I sort of got the ball and looking for him, and he's over the other side. And I'm <laughs> done. <you know? laughs> gradually, gradually, the play started to go over the other side of the pitch, you know. So, it, yeah, it was a great achievement. We were 3 0 up anyway, you know. So. And also, we should mention, of course, AS Roma, who I think yeah, did, yeah. was Capello in their team when you played them. I think he was, was Yeah, he was. I think, yeah, they did say he was in there, yeah. But, so uh, no. the Anglo-Italian Cup Winners' Cup, I think it was labelled, wasn't it? A bit unwieldy, but a nice trophy. Yeah, it was a nice trophy. No, it was a great experience at that time because none of us had, had played abroad, I suppose, unless we, had, you know, on on tour or something like that. Not a competitive game, so you know, it, it, it was a good experience in that time. I think you thrashed Juventus four 0 didn't you, at home? Yeah, we did, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a, an amazing result when you think yeah, about I think it. Isn't it? Was the pace of the game we played, uh, the, you know, in those days they were a little bit conservative, weren't they? You know, tended to keep the ball, but we were, you know, not direct, but we did try to get to the end or end pretty quick, you know. And uh, you had you had like Don and Pete Noble and people like that up front, weren't they? So, you know, it's. Uh, what did you think of that decision that you weren't allowed to play in the first cut? Because I th would you have done all right in that? I think you'd have done all right, wouldn't so. you? Yeah, I think so. Looking at the, you know, the the competition we went in, uh, I think you know we more than held our own, and I think uh, we'd have, we'd have been okay. I think, yeah, yeah. So it all kind of, I mean, I wouldn't say unravelled from then on, but obviously the team. I'm guessing, began to break up. Peter Noble went off to Burnley. Um, Fred Ford departed. Dave Mackay comes in. Uh, Stan Harlan goes to Birmingham. Yeah. It, it all begins to unravel a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, once you started to, like, Stan went, uh, as you say, Peter Noble went, and then gradually uh, Rob Thomas went with Dave Mackay to Derby when he went to Derby. Don went to... Uh, Crystal Palace with Burt Head and things like that. So gradually it, it uh, deteriorated, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it wasn't no surprise it, when we got relegated, really, because you, you lost some very good players, very good players. How was that for you? I mean, you're a Swindon through and through. How did that feel when it all did begin to lose uh, its, you know, sparkle, as it were? Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it, 
I think it, it's slightly different in our day than now because you had people who, who stayed quite a few seasons, you know, and, and you were there and, and you know, you, you had the odd one come in and take somebody's place or add it to the squad. But uh, I think, uh, you know, to lose, and they were mates, they weren't just fellow teammates, they, they were mates as well, you know, and uh, it was, it, but in football, as it's proved since, you know, that, that's it, people move on, don't they, and, and managers move on and all this kind of thing, so, yeah. Did you ever have any offers? Not that I know of. Oh. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have been <laughs> well, that's not true, is it? But, I mean, I, I guess that it was the club who had the offer and the player wasn't really involved until he was told to go. Told to go. Is that right? That's right. No, we had... Uh, you didn't have agents or anything like that. You negotiated in, in the early 60s. I mean, uh, you had um, one-year contracts and you were called in and said, uh, you know, you're retained or you're released. That's how it was done. You know, so, and then you said, well, I'll, I'll give you a five a rise. <laughs> <laughs> so would you, I mean, so we equate it to modern times and we know Owen Doyle's moved on now, but would you have had that situation? His contract was up. So what was, the, the club would still have offered him a new contract, but it, the club yeah. was in control. Is that right? Yeah, they were. Yeah, they held your, what they called the, your registration. Uh, and they, they, if they held your registration, you didn't move. But gradually that, you know, sort of freedom of contract and things like that came in, didn't it? That, uh, they did keep it lower down that you get a development fee if it's under, was it 23, 24? Yeah. Uh, but uh, other than that, you know, you, if, you, if your contract finished, they still had, held your registration. Let's talk about your record breaking because it is extraordinary. Um, there you are, Jimmy Dickinson held the record for ages, didn't he? Seven hundred and sixty-four, yeah. uh, which you know it's a bit like Bobby Charlton's goal-scoring record for England. You know, it's one of those things every schoolboy used to know. Um, and you come along and break it. Uh, there was you retired once before that, didn't you? And then came back. Is that right? Yeah, I, I retired in nineteen seventy-eight to take over the youth team. As Danny said, oh, the, you know, they were looking for a youth coach. You, you, you're 30, 35 then. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you like it? But the only proviso is that you, you stop playing. Uh, and I had to think of that hard because I was still pretty fit. And Bob, Bob uh, Smith came in and they had a bad start to the season. They got some bigger names in who, who were on quite a lot of money for that time, uh, as I know, because I took over and I know what they were on. Um, <laughs> but uh, then he, he, he's, he's uh, having a bath in the referees and he said, uh, I want you to play Saturday. I said, what do you mean you want me to play? I ain't played for a year. You know, he said, ah, you're fit enough. Uh, and it was uh, Rotherham. And we did win, actually. I think it was 2-1. Uh, and then that's how I broke the record because I think I was about ten behind when when I retired. If I yeah, uh, and so playing in that extra ten gave me the record. Yeah, uh, which you still hold to this day, and it's unlikely, I think, ever to be broken. I, I, I would imagine. Uh, I think the nearest at the moment who's still playing is a lad Lewington at uh, MK Dons. Oh right, yes, he's been around forever, hasn't he? But that, uh, yes. Yes, goodness only knows how many he's on. <laughs> I think he's an heiress, somebody told me. Uh, yes. I think he's Did, done 600 odd, I think. So he's got another few. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that figure of, of 770, that, that, that is amazing. And, uh, you know, when you start out, I'm guessing, you know, to play one season, fantastic. But to, yeah. to play that many league games, we should say, because yes. quite a few other games as well, on top yeah. of that. Yeah, it was amazing. Well, competitive games, it was 8-8-9. Eight, eight, yes. For the FA Cup and the uh, League Cup games. So, you know, it was towards 900 games. So, you know, but that's all I wanted to do as a kid, play for Swindon Town. And luckily, I, I managed to play more, more times than anybody. So, 
you know, I just feel myself lucky that I was uh, good enough in their eyes to, to play professional football. So Danny Williams had been back and, and put together a very exciting side, 74, 75. And I have to say, we had a question in, you went on a tour of Tunisia. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had a, a sort of message on uh, Twitter from uh, a contributor called Happiness is 4038. You love your speedway. I love my speedway. You yeah. will know what that means. But th they wanted to know about that tour of Tunisia, which again was unusual because that was quite exotic to go off to North Africa, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a tournament, actually. Yeah, it, uh, you know, and I don't think, was it Bournemouth there as well? I think somebody like, but it was like a tournament. Yeah, yeah. But that, you know, that's the kind of thing that had come into the game, you know, we, you know, throughout the 60s. I, I think we did go to Holland in the 60s, but I think, it, you know, it was... Uh, um, you know, later on in, in my career, the team started to go on a little tour, didn't they? You know, or a tournament or whatever. How did you do in Tunisia? Can you remember? I remember, Dick. No, uh, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> okay. All right. But I, it's sandy pitches, I'm guessing, were they? People would talk to me and they say this. And I said, was it? You know, I mean, <laughs> they know more about my career than I do. <laughs> <laughs> sandy pitches, a bit like Wembley, then, yeah, in that case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They, um, certainly, so, they certainly weren't muddy. Yeah. <laughs> so then, let's talk about when you do retire eventually and the chance to manage the club comes along. It was Bobby Smith who departed, I think, a disappointing start to a campaign. How did you feel when you were offered the job? Well, what happened is it was that season that I broke the record and Bob Smith had asked me to come back in the side having took the youth team. Then Danny took over as a caretaker manager. Uh and he, he said, I've had enough, um, and they want you to take over. And I, nah, I'm not sure I'd rather go back to the youth. Um, and it was probably the worst decision of my career in football. Um, didn't enjoy it at all. Um, and it was, I think it was Doc Nicholas, John Nicholas, the club doctor, said, you'll expect people to do what you do, and they won't. Uh, and he was right. And it's, it's the worst decision I ever made. I wish I hadn't have done it. I wish I'd have gone back to the youth team. Sadly, relegation to Division 4 came about, didn't it? And if I remember right, you made a decent start to the following campaign. Is that right? Okay. We did OK, Vic. Uh, I mean, it, it was a case of uh, um, getting rid of the big earners um, and putting the youth in. You know, because Paul Rideout, Charlie Henry, Brian Hughes, Paul Batty, Colin Bailey. I had to put all them in and all the all the people that Bob Smith had brought in late in his manager fit um, were on big money in those days and we, I had to get rid of them. And you're talking about um, a marathon. I had to run a marathon to get some training kit. Wow. Uh, uh, you know, equipment and balls and all that. And I, I, in them day, I raised over a, a thousand pound just to, to the club, not for me, for the club, uh, to get some kit and, and balls and bibs and things like that. And people don't know what you, uh, what kind of time it was when I was manager. It was about getting rid of all the, so say, better players. Um, and they were better players. You know, they had obviously a lot of experience, but, you know, if they're not, producing the goods and they're getting paid quite a lot of money in those days uh, and you know you bring a, a, a lot of younger players in and they did all right they, they gave their all but it, it just didn't happen you know but we we played some decent football and uh, I thought we were a bit unfortunate to go down but that's football and then obviously uh, the next season we, we were okay I think we were eighth or ninth and then you know all of a sudden they want to change that's How did you feel uh, at that moment? Well, I, had, I, had it, I had it written in that I go back to the youth team, so I safeguarded myself a little bit because I did enjoy developing, but rather than um, uh, I don't think you coach some of the senior players, you guide them and you, you, you look after them, you know, and make sure they're on your side. So if you have a go at some, uh, you know, they, uh, they are some of them are a little bit uh, titchy, aren't they? <laughs> so that decision's taken. So were you relieved in a way? Because yes. Ken Beamish Ken Beamish took over, didn't he? But 
You well, I'm yes, is the answer. Yeah. I brought Ken in as an assistant, and he was okay. He was good, good lad. Um, he took over, but he had the same problem as me. And he, he did. He lasted about a year, I think, didn't he? And then obviously that was the the start of Lou. Yeah, and it's not the end of your managerial uh, role at Swindon, isn't it? Because I first met you, obviously, when uh, <laughs> there was that memorable Easter, if you remember, um, when now the late Harry Gregg and Lou Macari had fallen out. Yeah. Both were dismissed. Eventually, Lou was reinstated and yeah. chose you as his assistant. Yeah, he, he cared. Obviously, they, they didn't get on in the end. They started off OK, but, uh, you know, in the end, they... And Lou said, would you come? I said, well, I'd rather be with you. But he said, no, no you'd be good because you know the lads and so-and-so. So in the end, again, a bad decision by me. Um, I enjoyed my time with Lou. You know, it, we got two promotions. But gradually, I, I, I wanted to get back to developing lads. Uh, so I, I said to Lou, I'd rather go back to the youth. Uh, and he said... He said, I, th I thought you did. He said, and everybody got a niche in, in, in the game and yours is with the younger players. And that's when he brought Chick in, which was a, a great, great signing. Chick was a great lad. Yeah, former player, of course. Who <laughs> it, There were two great partnerships at, at one point at Swindon, weren't there? There was Mays and Rowland and Bates and Gilchrist. I mean, they both were fabulous scoring partnerships, weren't they? Well, I was lucky to play, you know, because... We didn't sort of play across the back and like they do now. We tended to knock it in the channel and things like that if nothing was on. And people like Peter Noble, Chick Bates, to have them, you could just knock it. And you knew they would they would try to make it into a good ball, you know, even though a lot of mine went into touch, you know. So <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> they, were, they were great to play with, great to play with. And Chick was... <laughs> Yeah, he was fit. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, this is a time when Lou Macari comes in and then eventually he goes off to West Ham. We know troubles at the club, clearly, yeah. as we know about that. Yeah. But then we have this period where Ozzy Ardiles, who we all, all watched in the 1978 World Cup in black and white in Argentina, comes in as manager. Glenn yeah. Hoddle comes in as a manager. Steve McMahon's in as manager. Your youth coach under all these people... Yeah. They were huge names in football. Yeah, yeah. Well, they just let me do it. Well, not uh, the last one you mentioned, but... Uh, no, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, if you don't oh, mind, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, no, but how did you get on with Ozzy and Glenn Hoddle? Very supportive. And Glenn, although Glenn left it to John Gorman to, to liaison with me and come and watch the games more so. Than, but Ozzy was very... He, he, he liked the kids and... He said, oh, yeah, you've done, you know, good job and all that. So, and I enjoyed because you, you had a contrast in styles. Uh, and, you know, Lou, obviously, you know, it was about percentages and all that kind of thing. But you got two promotions, so you can't argue. Uh, and Ozzy came in and it was a totally different style of play with the same players, most of the same players. And they adapted. And I, you know, obviously we got to the playoffs and then it was taken away from us. So, yes. Mm. Uh, and obviously Glenn come in. Um, some of the best football I've seen anyway, you know, and uh, him in particular was, you know, <laughs> to just to watch. Uh, yeah. and, um, I did say to John, I said, Do, would, would Glenn let me come in the dressing room at half time and things like that? Because, you know, I, I, even though he was younger than me, um, I, I picked a lot up from Glenn, uh, and he's the best tactical person I've been in, the, or coach or manager I've been in a dressing room with. Well, it was certainly a golden era in the team. I mean, he was very clear, wasn't he? From he wanted all his teams to play in one particular yeah. way. He was very clear with that, wasn't he? Yeah, but his, his was mixed up more because obviously he was a great long pass for the ball, whereas Ozzy had this little triangles and all this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, Glenn had the perfect because there was, there was some good football played. And I, I, I can't ever forget, I wish I'd have been playing in, in, with him because 
Dave Kerr's like and Paul Bowden, and yeah. he, he used to ping balls to them right to their feet, you know, and you think, oh, I wish I was in, I'd have been on the run. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it was a good time. It was a good time, yeah. Yeah. I should actually mention, it's just come back to me, I, I, I one golden night against Liverpool, Bill Shankly's Liverpool uh, yeah. in the League Cup. Uh, I mean, it was a magnificent night, and Don Rogers was at his pomp. You were at your pomp. I mean, you... You didn't destroy Liverpool, but you certainly made them second best that night, didn't you? Uh, well, I did for a spell, but I did my hamstring. That was one of the injuries yeah. I actually I, I crossed for the, I don't know whether it was a first or second goal to Don, and uh, I pulled my hamstring. So that's how I remember that game. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first, because if I remember rightly, Don did his repeat at Wembley and went round the keeper and slotted it into the net. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fabulous. I mean, that, that was one of the ones because I, I can't remember how I'd done all the injuries, really, because I, I had so few. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill Shankly was very upset after that performance. I think he, he didn't like that at all. Um, can we mention your departure? I, I don't know how much you want to say on that, but, you know, you've given this club 30-odd years of service and it all came to a bit of a sour end. I don't know what you want to say about that. How, how did that happen? Uh, no, it, there was, you could tell there was something going on, um, and I was warned by one of the members of the staff, not the playing staff, office staff, to watch me back. And I said, what, what are you on about watching me back? You know, and, it, and that's the first inkling I had it. And within a short period, uh, he said, uh, I want you to leave. Um, and uh, I mean, some of it, it you know, it, it hurts, actually, because... He accused me of not bringing any players through when, you know, you've had Fitzroy Simpson, Nicky Summerby and all that just a, a couple of years before. Um, so it was hard to take, um, but it wasn't on his, in my eyes, it wasn't on what he thought about me. It must have been somebody else because I'd never see him look at the youth team on a Saturday morning. He's never come in to my, my training sessions, which John Gorman did. Um, didn't come to the centre of excellence. So really, I did, and I just don't see the reasons why. And I still don't. Yeah, I can tell it, it still rankles. Um, so we'll leave it there, I think. Um, we should also mention, of course, in 1970, you played against Jack Charlton, that great lead side, didn't you, in the FA Cup quarter-final. <laughs> He sadly left us this weekend. I mean, my goodness, what a team that was to play against. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you can... You, like, so many great players, Collins, Bremner, Larmer, Jones. And it, you know, you can go on, can't you? Eddie Gray, people like that. Um, but it, it, it was sad to hear, you know, because obviously he's a great, not only a, a, a very good footballer, he's a great character uh, and served football very, very well. Yeah, indeed. Um, so then I think you worked for Wolves for a while, didn't you? Um, well, I went to Bristol Rovers before that for a year. Um, right. and then I had a difference of opinion on how I should develop lads and left <laughs> with a, <laughs> certain, a certain manager. But there we are. That, that's Again, that's football. Uh, yeah. I, I don't do anything I don't want to do, as people would tell you. If I don't want to do anything, I won't do it. Um, and then I, I worked for the Football League for seven years as a uh, sort of regional officer, um, coming down your way, Exeter, Plymouth, uh, Torquay were in it then, and uh, two Bristol's all around there. So I worked for them for seven years because um, they used to get grant a money, funding money, which I think they still do. And my job was to see that they were using it in the right way and not uh, just squandering it somewhere else, you know, and uh, uh, you have to do reports and all that. And uh, and then I got an offer of, uh, oh, I was 62 then, um, I had an offer to go to Wolves as uh, assistant academy manager, which I thoroughly enjoyed. You know. And now you aren't, uh, well, you are involved in the game because obviously I see you quite often watching Swindon uh, play on a Saturday. And um, I, I know you don't comment too much on, on the modern game because it's you're not involved in it. But what have you thought of the way they've played this season? It's been joyous, hasn't it? I, I, I said 
right from sort of October time that they were the best side that I'd seen. Uh, and I think the best three teams went up this year. I mean, I don't, I don't like to comment because it's either sour grapes or whatever, but, you know, but um, they were the best team in the league, I thought, this season. And uh, the right three have gone up. Well, we'll wait and see what happens. These are extraordinary times, of course. Nobody yeah. really knows what's no. going to happen. That's the problem, yeah. I'm guessing. I mean, I mean, looking back at your... T- many people often say, you know, do players have regrets about the fact they're not playing in today's money? I'm guessing you just played for the love of it, basically, didn't you? Well, it's about just playing football. My first uh, professional contract was £7 um, and £10 in the season, you know, 1960. So... You know, it wasn't done for the money because the average person that was earning just as much, you know, or all but as much. Um, but no, I, I just wanted to be a professional footballer, and luckily, I, I uh, most managers stood by me. Well, all all me playing uh, managers uh, stood by me, uh, and I, I think I was dropped about once or twice throughout my career. So unless I was injured. So. I can't complain. I, I'm, I'm glad I stayed and, uh, uh, you know, I fulfilled what I wanted to do. You certainly did. And I have to say, from a personal point of view, it was always wonderful to watch you play. I, you know, I gosh, saw you all the way through from the 60s and, and obviously got to know you, which was great pleasure to do. So, I, I, you know, it was great watching you. That overlapping fullback role was just something that you excelled in. And, you know, you were so fit, and uh, I, I'm guessing you would do all right these days, wouldn't you? I think on the, on the fitness side, I, looking at players today, their their overall body is is fitter because I never done stomach exercises, I never done weights. All we concentrated on was the waist downwards and do hill runs and all this kind of thing. And I mean, I used to do extra, and people used to call me an idiot for doing it players this was not just other people and uh, I said well you ain't running for me on a Saturday you know and I always said if I go up then I'll get back nearly as quick uh, and luckily I had the energy to do that you know but uh, it wouldn't uh, you know I, I wasn't just fit naturally you, you still had to work at it and, and keep your fitness and we were fit and I mean the the only one I confessed to was fitter was Roger Smart. He was fit. <laughs> you talk about fitness, he could run. He could run forever, you know. And uh, but, uh, luckily, and, and John Nicholas, again, the club doctor, said we should clone you, you know, because I had very few injuries and things like that. And, you know, but uh, I'm glad Danny came because he, he, he released me to join in. And Don was brilliant because... Um, you, he got the ball and the trigger was if he started to go inside then I was outside and uh, we played behind each, I played behind him for 10 years so yeah. I forget to know what he was going to do <laughs> I remember going to Palace and watching uh, Swindon at Palace uh, when he scored the first goal yeah. uh, do you remember that one? Uh, he no. just gone. <laughs> Fair enough uh, and, and actually, where you're situated right now, we should say big thanks to John Holloway and the Community Foundation not only for for helping us out tonight, but for the work that they've been doing throughout this pandemic. And I've got one or two of the, the snoods that you can get from the Community Foundation. Where you're situated now is magnificent, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And I, I was lucky enough that uh, I was asked by John and his staff to uh, cut the first sod, as they say, with uh, uh, Nicky or uh, the Albury uh, Sheriff of Wiltshire at that time, I think. And then we were asked back to, to do the opening. So, I, you know, I've got on well with John and I'll, I'll help the, any way I can, you know, because uh, it's a great facility and it's, it's, it's what the club needed. And uh, it's a pity it's not the club's, uh, you know, we couldn't develop it into a, a tremendous training ground because for all the success we've had, we've never had a, a, a decent training ground of our own, which... You know, it's a, it's a pity, really, because, you know, you can do so much uh, good work 
and the pitches are better now, aren't they? Even on the training ground, they're like bowling greens, aren't they? So well, they certainly are, and the, and the 4G surfaces are wonderful, aren't they? You know, for the community, and that is, it's tremendous. Absolutely. Yeah, we pay tribute to the work they've been doing through the pandemic as well. It's a yeah. fantastic thing. Yeah. Um, John, what an absolute pleasure! Thank you so much for your time. Apologies for the technical difficulties at the beginning, but we got there in the end. Chris, are you going to rejoin us now? I certainly am, and. John, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, I wish I was a bit older so I could have uh, actually witnessed it. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that, Chris. That's really good. Of you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, John, we've got quite a few questions. So if you're okay to, to stay for a, a little while, that'd be great. Controversial. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is from Swindon Sparkle. What was it like traveling to away games? Because there would have been no motorways, so it would have took forever to, um, to get anywhere. And not having the luxury coaches we have these days, um, was it uh, a long and winding uh, road, as they say? Well, one of the best uh, things I can remember, uh, it was the old Bristol buses at that time they used to have. And uh, you, the fumes used to come into the bus. So you, you, you're like this, you, you, you're rubbing your eyes and everything, you know. And uh, yeah, we, we did go on Fridays though, but uh, it was a long way to Carlisle yes. when you had no motorways. And I can remember playing at Grimsby for a night game and we travelled on the day and we come back after and I got back at five o'clock in the morning. So we left about sort of eight o'clock in the morning, stopped for a bit of lunch play the game and then come straight back home. So that, that is how we used to do it. You know, nobody, nobody you had no choice. just got on with it. That, that's how it was in those days. You know, I mean, they, they, they only got life of luxury now, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, I always remember Ken Furphy saying when he played for Barrow, Workington, he said they used to keep a shovel in the back of the bus because they knew that during the winter they'd have to dig themselves out of snowdrifts. So that's... The players used to have to get out and dig the snow away from the bus. Sorry on that. I think that might have been Grimsby or Hull, and we got stuck, or somebody in front of us got stuck. So we got out the bus, and there was a, a chap with the advert, RCE, Ron Endersby or something like that, who used to travel on the coach. And we're digging him out, with this one in front, to get, get us moving, to get home. And he put in the... We got out to dig the, the lorry out or something like that. <laughs> And he'd sat on the coach all the time. <laughs> but yeah, that, you took it as part and part of, parcel of travelling in those days. You had no motorways and you certainly didn't grit like they do now. Exactly. It's a good time. Yeah, we enjoyed it. We enjoyed the idea. Sure. I, I yeah. Um, so one from Anthony. We've got a couple from Anthony, actually. In your 700 plus games... What was the most memorable game, excluding the cup final? <laughs> Can't remember all that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't score many goals. I did kick a few off the line, but I, I can't say there was too many that uh, I can remember that were outstanding. I mean, if you're a, a forward or, or whatever and you score goals, then, yeah, you can... You can uh, think of those can't you but no I, I don't think I had too many memorable games you know you just uh, you were in the team and that that was it okay um I think we've actually hit on this one through the conversation did you have any opportunities or offers to play elsewhere as I said a bit uh, not that I know of um in those days you didn't have agents as I said okay. um and you didn't get to know if they didn't want you to know, you didn't know. Yeah. Certainly you, you, you had rumours or whatever and uh, found a lot out. And I think it was it the people or something like that on a Sunday. And they used to have a thing that, you know, speculation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't get mentioned in that. No. <laughs> Not like social media these days. <laughs> Um, one from James Spencer. Do you enjoy uh, watching the current Swindon team? And again, we've touched on that already. And how do you think we'll get on in Division One? I think uh, I've enjoyed quite up to 
obviously the necessary break, I thought that, that they'd improved. Um, and I thought the additions, uh, Yates, Doyle, Grant, people like that made a big difference um, from the start of the season. Uh, and as I said before, from about October, I said we'd definitely go up because I, I couldn't see any team better than us. And I couldn't, you know, the odd team did, like crew, I think, gave us quite a good game. But, uh, you know, the, other than that, you, you couldn't see us. I, I, I thought it done well. And it, they, whoever it was, whether it was Richie or, or Paul Jewell or whoever brought those players in seemed to just gel the squad together, I thought. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it this season. Um, <clears throat> you know, whether they'll go on from there, I mean, obviously, uh, you don't know the makeup of the side. You do know that Doyle won't be there and whatever. But, uh, you know, if he can keep most of the, the team that got us promoted, then, yeah, you've got a fair chance, I think. Because I think you always get, after, like Vic said, we seem to get promoted and then have a good spell. It's just after that initial spell, can you maintain it? And uh, yeah, I, I think they'll do okay. Hopefully, anyway. Yeah, fingers crossed. Definitely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, Peter Lango, who was your who was the toughest player you played against? Toughest. There was, a, there was Terry Payne of Southampton, um, probably one of the dirtiest wingers I played against. Um, a lad called Stuart Scullion who played for Watford, um, which probably people hadn't heard, but he, he was one I could never, and there was another Trevor Tainton at Bristol City, could never get hold of him for some reason. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, and, and the, the one who, who gave me a lot of problems, and this is where I think it was Frank or somebody shouted stop lacrosse, and it was Alan Woodward of Sheffield United. Yeah. And he used to, he used to just bend it round you. And I said, I can, you better come and do it, you know. Uh, but different people cause you different problems, didn't they? But I always used to um, try to take them down the other end when Danny came so that, you know, they weren't taking me on around my own penalty area. So, And I remember playing Bristol City and Chris Garland was right side midfield for them. And he said, can you stop going forward? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can't say there's one player who calls me. I mean, it's like a pl like Liverpool, you say, like your colleague and, and people like that. You know, they're, they're good players, aren't they? You know, and uh, it, it's a good test for us. But uh, hopefully we've done OK. Sometimes, sometimes not, especially <laughs> the block on Shrewdham Road. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder if he still goes. <laughs> Um, the the <laughs> <laughs> For those who haven't had the uh, fortune to see you play, what modern player would you compare yourself against? Or compare yourself to, sorry. That's a hard one. It's a hard one. I think one of the ones would be, you know, I mean, the, the modern, obviously, left sided players. But, um, you know, uh, well, he's not in the side at the moment, or he, his veins at uh, Everton. He, he's very similar, actually, and he, he likes to join in. But they're better on the ball than ever I was. They were, you know, they're brought up in the academies now to be better on the ball. Um, I could run, and, and uh, usually if I overlap, Don put it on the plate so I could cross it. You know, I didn't have to do too much to beat players and, and things like that. So it was a case that is, is, you know, slightly different than some of them now. They can beat players as well, can't they? But it's hard to say who would be the same. I don't think they, they get back as quick as I did mine. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I, as I said to you earlier, I, you know, to me, you were the first of the modern wingbacks, as far as I was concerned. And actually, you watch wingbacks these days and... You re, you know remind me of your playing days because yeah. that's how you play. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, it was quite a number of years ago now, and they said, "Oh, this is a new way of fullbacks are playing." And we we done that in the sixties, not so much Rod, but I mean that that allowed us to nearly play three centres, central defenders because I I'd gone up the pitch 
you know, with Don. So, you know, it's, uh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, you know. So that's all you can. If you're enjoying playing, then, then you do it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. Just another couple more here from Pete Norris. What is your favourite piece of STFC memorabilia? Your personal favourite? Well, I got me, uh, I got me uh, Wembley kit. Still, the white, it's white strip, you know. So I've, I've got that. I've got every program that I played in right. in my loft. So I got nearly nine hundred programs up, up in the loft. Wow! <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, I should you... imagine your League Cup tankard is pretty um, is pretty up much up there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's in the cabinet. Not too much more in mine, but there is, it's in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just the last one from Harvey Ferlin. Who is the best young player you have helped develop? It's, it's hard to say the best. I mean, you, in different positions, you, you, you know, you, you've had Paul Roy out in the, around 1980, and I put... I gave him his debut at 16, um, went on to Aston Villa and went into Italy, I think, Roma, was it Roma? Or uh, Bari, Bari, Bari. Yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously Fitzroy Simpson went to Man City, you know, so, yeah, I mean, we, we had a fair fair amount play league football, you know. Um, I think they forget that, you know, it, when, I, when I was told I didn't bring anybody through, but when you work back on the early 90s, there's quite a few. You know, 85 Ash come through. I mean, Paul, my lad didn't get the chance here, but he went on and played in the Premier League. So, you know, it's that's, it's hard to say the best, but, you know, you, you like to think that you, you helped them and guided them the right way. Well, Paul, of course, an international for Wales, which, uh, yeah. you know, we should mention. And, uh, yeah, I, I remember that debut for Paul Rideout. He had a fantastic goal ruled out for offside, didn't he? David yeah. Peach was stood in an offside position out in the Shrivenham yeah. Road stand somewhere. Yeah. Well, that, that's how it was in them days, wasn't it? You know, you, it wasn't just the person who shot. You know, you, you could be off, offside out there and it was given, wasn't it? You know, so, but... Uh, no, I mean we won three one that game. I think didn't we? Yeah, yeah he got ahead of later on, didn't he? he? Got he did get a goal in that one. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. I mean he was he, he was a man at sort of sixteen, really. You know, and, uh, you could always see that he was he was going to make his way in the game. So, yeah. Yeah, but there's several more that's come come through and had a, a career in football, haven't they? You know. Well, Paul Rydak got a winner in an FA Cup final, so that was pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. My pleasure. John, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. And uh, we could literally be here for four or five hours uh, because we've had to skirt through your career, which has been magnificent. But thank you for bearing with us at the beginning. Brilliant. That's okay. No problem. And thank you also to John Holloway as well. I'll be trying to get in now. <laughs> Sorry, say it again. It's down to me. You still be trying to get in now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, if you um, can't get in next season, John, give me a call and we'll get you in. Is that all right? <laughs> I'll just ask Don, you, you get us in. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> John, thank you so much. It's been brilliant. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Chris, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, Vic, um, as usual. Very good host. Um, thank you, everybody. That's the end of our On the Sofa for this week. Um, Keep tuned and we'll uh, be advertising some more shortly. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night.